There we are. Right now, President Biden is meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping, but it's not just the issues at stake that have people talking. We go inside the luxurious estate where it's all happening. Plus, a 40-mile trek to free the hostages kidnapped by Hamas. We join the journey from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And stunning new developments in the death of a teen who was beaten to death while trying to save a friend. What's next for the suspects now facing murder charges? Well, good afternoon. Today is Wednesday, November 15th, and I'm Nick Smith, in for Nicole Burley, who has the day off. We continue to follow that breaking news along our southern border. We have exclusive video from within the past couple of hours as hundreds of migrants try crossing into the U.S. illegally. News Nation border correspondent Ali Bradley is live in Eagle Pass. Ali, you had video that really left some of us in the newsroom shaken. Yeah, me too out here, Nick. We've all been uh, kind of reeling with this out here. It's a, a scene that's tough because it's the human side, right? That's the reality down here. It's a very human issue, but it's also a very legal issue that's being battled across our country, right? So what we can tell you right now, hundreds of migrants successfully crossed into Texas this morning. It's been happening every single morning for the last couple of weeks here. They're seeing it about 8 a.m., Hundreds of people over in Piedras Negras, which is the city sister, uh, sister city to Eagle Pass here. Uh, they basically form a big group, and this morning the fog was thick, and it was so ominous and eerie out there because you could just hear this, like, rumbling of a crowd. You know, there were 200 people on the riverbanks across the river. You couldn't see a single one of them, but you could hear it, and you could feel that energy. And as soon as the cloud started to lift, those individuals started to crum come across the river. Now, they did actually start to use a rope. They even formed a human chain at one point. And what was really interesting in this group is it was a lot of women and kids, Nick. We saw a lot of really little kids out there. And Florida Wildlife Commission has been down here for months. They've been deployed under Governor Ron DeSantis in conjunction with Governor uh, Greg Abbott, who, of course, continues to expand Operation Lone Star. And that's a partnership that they have. So those guys took us down there, and they were showing us how they take the high ground <clears throat> excuse me, and they stand up and they look down below and they help call out to Texas DPS and other uh, Florida Wildlife Commission officers in the water when there are kids in the water, Nick. So when we watch these adults walk across with a kid on their shoulders, Florida Wildlife Commission would say, hey, we need to be mindful. We need to go and help those people. And they would isolate certain individuals that were struggling or needed a little bit of help. And they were throwing them life preservers and they were helping them to, of course, prevent any loss of life. Now, we also watch Texas DPS out there on an airboat trying to encourage them to go back, trying to tell them not to cross. But here's the reality. We also watched a man dressed in all black who law enforcement say is an armed coyote over there, basically guarding a group of 10 women and kids not allowing them to go back up the hill. So regardless of the, the legal pathways here that are only about a mile away from where these individuals cross because the port of entry with that CBP-1 app is only about a mile away, they're going to cross where the cartel's going to make them cross, Nick, because it's a $13 billion a year industry. They want to make that money, and they're not going to do it with these legal pathways. So every single day, basically, they get a big group over in Piedras Negras ready, they get them down to the riverbanks in the morning, and then they come across. And Border Patrol wasn't really down here this morning at all to respond. Texas DPS and Florida Wildlife Commission were. Now, what's interesting with that piece, Border Patrol has the immigration authority down here right now. They have the legal authority. Texas DPS can't really do a lot. They can arrest for criminal trespass, but there's a lot of legal issues with that. But speaking of legal issues... SB4 just passed the Texas legislature last night. That's the most controversial and sweeping legislation regarding immigration that we've seen. And it will give permission to Texas DPS and to Florida Wildlife Commission because they have jurisdictional power to be here per the governor. They will be able to allow those, uh, arrest those individuals that you're watching cross the river and uh, basically charge them for illegal entry. Uh, now, there are provisions in there where there's a buffer. They have a magistrate that will handle that and will allow that individual to either go back to Mexico voluntarily or they're going to be prosecuted for a Class B misdemeanor and ultimately removed anyways, Nick. But here's the thing. Texas is seeing a little bit of a decrease in illegal immigration. But the people aren't stopping crossing into the U.S. They're going to the Tucson sector. The Tucson sector is seeing more than 2,000 people a day. So what we're seeing down here in Texas is just a small fraction of what's going on at the border. And you're dealing with that very human problem. You guys have seen my coverage. I've been down here. I've seen a lot of gotaways, you know, the people that run off into the bushes, Nick. And to be down here and to watch little kids watching adults receive CPR, watch, watching little kids see adult men pulled out of the water lifeless 
I mean, we all had to take a moment there because the little kid even put his hands up and said, said like, stop. It was just so powerful and it, it has an impact on everyone down here, Nick. Allie, even with all the reporting and the legality of it all, you always manage to find the heart. Allie Bradley live for us this afternoon in Eagle Pass, Texas. Allie, thank you. Here with us to help break this all down is Art Del Cueto, Vice President of the National Border uh, Pat uh, Patrol Council. Art, you and I just heard Allie's report. Allie's talking about the human side of this as well as the uh, illegality of the uh, crossings. Uh, this is a situation that the governor is now hoping that new legislation that he's, uh, that he's expected to sign uh, will indeed uh, help curb uh, some of these illegal <laughs> acts of entry. Do you think it will be enough? Well, I mean, it's enough as far as it does help curb it. At the same time, it, it's able to move the traffic. And the now the Border Patrol themselves are able to put agents in different areas and do some type of operations. But at the end, it's policies and policies and policies. And that's where the problem is. People continue to come across because they know they're not going to get detained. They know they have to just say asylum and they get released. And, you know, Ali does a fantastic job throughout the entire border. And she's one of the few that's been reporting, actually, the issues that are happening out in Tucson sector which continues to be, you know, bombarded with large groups every single uh, day. And what makes it different is the area in Tucson, there's nothing there. It's not as easy for agents to go out there and, and transport. It's not as easy for them to take them to a processing center. It takes hours. And that is what the cartels are banking on. They know that if they continue to bring it in other areas, they know if there's less media coverage and less people talk about it in those areas, they know they can continue to cause that distraction, continue to bring drugs into the country, because that's what it comes down to. It's a domino effect, and the cartels, they want to just make money, and it doesn't matter how they make it. Uh, and obviously, when they cause more and more distractions, they can get more drugs into the United States. And Mr. DeQuelto, you just said you just said something that I think it may have just flown right past so many of our viewers. You talked about the media coverage. Hey, Nick, if you're focused on Eagle Pass and the cameras are watching people struggling in the Rio Grande, guess what? They're moving up a way where there are no cameras and just crossing through many of the poorest points of the border. No, that's exactly right. I mean, they look. Uh, we've been seeing it out in Tucson sector for quite some time. It continues to lead the entire country in gotaways. Uh, and a lot of times, you know, the public doesn't see that. Uh, right now, when they're seeing, you know, group after group, I think CBP is reporting close to 13,000 a week out in Tucson sector. And a lot of these individuals have crossed into the United States. And a lot of it's because uh, Tucson sector, uh, some of the area where the agents are working out here is on the Tejano Autumn uh, Native American Reservation. So it's difficult to get, uh, you know, camera crews and everything else out there. But it's happening. It's happening every night. Uh, just not enough people are seeing it because of the remoteness of the areas where it is occurring at this time. And talk about the human side of this before I have to let you go, Mr. Del Cueto. Uh, the, the whole idea, we're watching these people struggle in the water. We see that. We know that when you see someone struggling that you all do offer aid. But more often than not, it also puts your agents in risk, too. It, it definitely does. It puts agents at risk at all times because they're even working in remote areas. So sometimes backup could be far away. And, and at the same time, look, the cartels, they're the ones that are going to tell the groups where they're going to cross. So they can come up with these Disneyland fast apps that this administration came up with and say, you have to go through this app in order to come across. It doesn't matter. The southern border is controlled by the cartels. They're going to tell people where and if they're going to cross. And that's where the ultimate problem is. And this administration has allowed that to continue to happen. Art Del Cuarto, thank you so much for helping me out today. Break that down, sir. Thank you. Uh, we turn now to breaking news in the war in Israel, where Israeli forces are carrying out a targeted raid at Gaza's main hospital. The IDF says they located a room containing unique technological means, uh, combat equipment and military equipment, which is being used, they say, by Hamas. Now, the raid comes as Qatari mediators are working to negotiate a deal that would see the release of dozens of hostages and include allowing in some humanitarian aid. News Nation's Robert Sherman is live in Tel Aviv with the latest. Robert, what more are you hearing about this possible hostage release deal and the additional uh, implementation of aid? Nick, we heard from an Israeli official today who said most of these negotiations, they're playing all of this very close to the vest, not putting a lot out into the public sphere. What we've heard really has come from Hamas spokespeople who said that they're open to a negotiation and to some kind of a deal which would release 
ultimately dozens of hostages in exchange for some kind of a ceasefire and aid to get in. The Israelis not really acknowledging the existence of these deals or where they stand on all of this. But President Biden saying last night that he remains optimistic that a deal will be cut soon. This is what he had to say. Mr. President, can you address the hostages directly and give them a message of hope and resilience in these troubling times? Yes, I can. I've been talking with the people involved every single day. I believe it's going to happen, but I don't want to get into detail. What's your message for the families? Hang in there. We're coming. Families of hostages continuing into the second day of their march from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, in which they say their hope is to continue to raise awareness, put this at the forefront of the conversation, and encourage the Israeli government, even demand the Israeli government do more to get the hostages out. The purpose is to bring the awareness about the hostages, to make sure this is the first priority for all the Israeli goals, make sure the government keep this as the first goal in order to make sure they will be back as soon as possible. And you see that targeted operation that's been taking place at Al Shifa Hospital. We're getting our first look at some of the things that they're finding inside of that hospital. You're seeing it on your screen here, weapons, vests. They've found go bags filled uh, with other kind of armaments and things of that nature. At this point, the IDF has not released any information on hostages or any clues, anything that they may have gleaned from that hospital so far. But again, that operation is ongoing as we speak, Nick. And again, once again, they're releasing these images to uh, support what they've said from the beginning is that uh, these munitions are being found in some of the places that are only supposed to be having civilians in need. Robert Sherman, live for us on the ground in Tel Aviv. Robert, thank you. Joining us now is one of the organizers of the march Robert was just talking about, Yuval Haran. He also has family members taken hostage by Hamas. Uh, Mr. Haran, first of all, um, I want to extend to you and your family uh, uh, the deepest of concern from everyone here at News Nation. I can only imagine how difficult this situation is for you, but you felt it necessary to organize this march to do what? Raise awareness, put pressure on political officials. What is your goal? I think it's, uh, first of all, thank you. And it's all of the above. It's to raise awareness. Is It's also that I can't sit at home anymore. My family mm -hmm. is in Gaza for 40 days. My niece, who is three years old, is there. We don't know anything about her. And, and we want to make sure that all the decision makers and, and the prime minister and the war cabinet and everyone hears our cry that we need them back home now. We can't wait anymore. Mr. Haran, we are showing video of the dozens and dozens of posters uh, with kidnapped across the top, showing the different faces. We see teddy bears uh, with the tape over their eyes because we know that so many children have been involved in this. When you hear... Uh, President Biden uh, say from the United States that hang in there, we're coming. Do those words offer comfort to uh, those of you who are still waiting to hear from loved ones, or uh, uh, does it fall hollow? I mean, it gives me hope, but until I see them with my eyes, until, you know, you're talking about children, only from my family, my three-year-old niece, my eight-year-old nephew, and my cousin, who is 12, have been taken from their home. And it gives us hope. Everything that can be done, and when Biden talks about bringing them back, it gives me hope. But until I hug them, until I tell them I love them, I mean, I, I need to do that in order to believe. Until I hold them in my arms, it's not enough. Mr. Ryan, I can only, again, I can only uh, empathize with how difficult this must be. When you came up with the idea or you're working with others to put together this march, how did you get others to uh, sign on board and say, you know what, I want to do this too? Were they, like you, feeling as though I just can't sit at home anymore, I have to do something? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I came up with this idea. And we have uh, an organization of all the families of those who've been taken, kidnapped, and been held hostage. And when I came up with this idea to the families that we need to be more vocal, we need to have our voices heard, most of them immediately wanted to join me. And we, we came up with this idea on Saturday, and we started mar marching yesterday on Tuesday. 
and and we're gonna go all the way. I hope we don't make it to Jerusalem because they're back. But and I hope all the families join us. I hope all the citizens of Israel join us because this is a march for everyone. This is all of our families. And Mr. Horan, I want you to know that we are there with you as well because we, once again, understand the pain and grief that you and members of your community are going through right now. Yuval Horan, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you sir. Up next, the highly anticipated meeting between President Biden and China's president. What's at stake behind closed doors? Plus, a Vegas teen killed after standing up to bullies. The arrest just made in the case and why it took weeks for charges to be filed. It's easy to get lost in investment research. Introducing J.P. Morgan Personal Advisors. Hey, David. Connect with an advisor to create your personalized plan. Let's find the right investments for your goals. Okay, great. J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. Had enough? No, arthritis. Here, ask for cream arthritis. Huh. Full prescription strength. Reduces inflammation. Thank the gods. Don't thank them too soon. Kick pain in the asper cream. Numbers move you, but some can stop you in your tracks, like the tens of thousands of people who were diagnosed with certain HPV-related cancers. For most people, HPV clears on its own. But for those who don't clear the virus, it can cause certain cancers. Gardasil 9 is a vaccine given to adults through age 45 that can help protect against certain diseases caused by HPV, including cervical, vaginal, vulvar, anal, and certain head and neck cancers, such as throat and back of mouth cancers and genital warts. Gardasil 9 doesn't protect everyone and does not treat cancer or HPV infection. Your doctor may recommend screening for certain HPV-related cancers. Women still need routine cervical cancer screenings. You shouldn't get Gardasil 9 if you've had an allergic reaction to the vaccine, its ingredients, or are allergic to yeast. Tell your doctor if you have a weakened immune system, are pregnant, or plan to be. The most common side effects include injection site reactions, headache, fever, nausea, dizziness, tiredness, diarrhea, abdominal pain, and sore throat. Fainting can also happen. Help protect what counts. Talk to your doctor or pharmacist about Gardasil 9. You'll find them in cities, towns, and suburbs all across America. Millions of Americans who have Medicare and Medicaid, but may be missing benefits they could really use. Extra benefits they may be eligible to receive at no extra cost. And if you have Medicare and Medicaid, Welcome back. We have breaking news. President Xi Jinping has arrived for that meeting with President Biden. That is the two of them right there for the first time in more than a year. They are in San Francisco. Our cameras are there and our own Nancy Liu has a live report from the ground. We have been waiting for this moment. It has been a while since the two leaders have had um, an opportunity to discuss many of the things that are important to the both of them. Uh, you can see Mr. Biden put his hand on the small of the back of Mr. Xi Jinping, and they are walking inside. That meeting has been one that both countries, uh, many experts uh, agree, have needed. Our own Nancy Liu is live in San Francisco right now. Nancy, this is the moment we have been waiting for, where we have said that both countries, the United States and China both, needed this meeting to happen. Absolutely, Nick. And this meeting has been in the works for quite some time. It actually followed the visit of California Governor Gavin Newsom to China just recently. He met with Xi in Beijing, and that got the ball rolling for what we're seeing today at the historic Filoli Estate. This is just south of San Francisco, and of course, this is far away from all of the protests that are happening outside of APEC. Presidents Biden and Xi, they have not met face to face as they are right now. It's been a full year. Their last handshake happened during the G20 summit in Bali. U.S.-China relations have gone increasingly tense since then, especially after a visit to Taiwan by former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. Now, for today, there is hope for some kind of joint agreement to fight the fentanyl crisis, a deadly problem in many U.S. cities, including here in San Francisco contributing to a lot of homelessness and crime, though there's been a big cleanup here ahead of APEC, especially in the areas around the conference and related events, the clearing of many homeless and criminal activity, that's angered residents who've been demanding that for years. Now, as for today's 
presidential bilateral meeting. No major deal making is expected, but there is so much to discuss, including the Israel-Hamas war, Russia, Ukraine, and AI. This morning, the Biden administration is saying the president will also reiterate U.S. support for Taiwan and its upcoming elections, as well as address multiple close calls this year between U.S. and Chinese military aircraft. We do not want to see the tensions uh, across the Taiwan Strait devolve into any kind of uh, conflict, certainly not military conflict that we don't want to see the status quo changed in a unilateral way and certainly not by force. And the president has repeatedly expressed U.S. support for Taiwan, announcing just back in July a $345 million military aid package to Taiwan, a move that definitely uh, China denounced. Nick. Absolutely. Nancy Liu live for us in San Francisco. Here now with some perspective on the president's high stakes meeting is Dave Rake, former deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy to China. Thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Nick. Good to be here. Mr. Rank, talk to us about why this meeting is so important. We heard Nancy talk about uh, the need for diplomacy between the two countries, but you believe that it's also a security issue as well. Uh, sure. I mean, it Nancy is exactly right. It's been a year, uh, two biggest countries in the world, two most influential countries. I, I just think it's really important for the two of them to sit down. Uh, and it's important to sit down because, as Nancy pointed out, uh, there have been some very close calls uh, between Chinese planes uh, and American planes and Chinese ships and American ships uh, in the South China Sea and the waters around Taiwan. So we've got to figure out a way, uh, even as we disagree, as we have very uh, different values and interests, uh, how to keep from uh, uh, coming to blows. And it's also a situation, we heard Nancy talk about in her reporting, how the fentanyl crisis is one with which we expect Mr. Biden to speak with Mr. Xi Jinping about. But also, there's the situation that China is dealing with, uh, with their population situation and uh, the lack of population growth and how they're uh, having a situation where so many young people can't find employment. There's something to be gained from both sides. Yeah, I don't know if... Joe Biden's going to help with the population problem, uh, but certainly Xi Jinping can help with the fentanyl issue here. Uh, and, and I know that the White House, the National Security Council, have been pushing to get some kind of deal that would restrict or uh, cut off the precursor chemicals, the things that go into making fentanyl. Uh, a lot of it goes through Mexico uh, and, and restrict that. There's some complicated uh, uh, diplomacy to be done, but the people I've talked to are, are relatively optimistic, and I know President Biden would love to get a deal on that. And Mr. Rank, you've been involved in some of these high-level conversations that help to uh, shape and craft the talking points. How do you expect this meeting to begin, and what would a win look like for Mr. Biden? So I think, you know, they're going to be together for four hours. That's a lot of time. Uh, usually both sides have to get through their talking points. They have to talk tough. Uh, you know, they start off in a big group meeting, and usually by the end it's down. They, they whittle away. It's kind of like musical chairs until you end up with maybe just the president and the national security advisor and uh, Xi Jinping and his closest uh, diplomatic advisor. Uh, and you get down to brass tacks of, you know, are we going to are we going to roll out some kind of deal? What do we get for it? What do you get? Uh, and so that's what I'd expect. Four hours is a lot of time, uh, but there are a lot of issues uh, between us right now. And you believe that if we have a win, that will be signaled this evening or down the road a bit? So I think a win, I think they'll roll, yeah, when, when presidents get wins, they announce them right away. They don't let anyone else do that. But, you know, I think what both Xi and Biden want to do is just put a lid on things that, you know, we're not going to wake up tomorrow with a, a changed relationship. But if, uh, especially going into an election year, if we can just lower the temperature, that'll be the win. Dave Rank, former deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy to China. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Thank you, Nick. Good to see you. Absolutely. We'll still ahead an exclusive interview. What the Gilgal suspect's ex-wife said to him in her first visit since his arrest. Plus, a chilling warning on Capitol Hill. What both the FBI and congressional leaders say about the threat of terrorism here in America. RFK Jr. Cuomo live.
the independent candidate shaking up the presidential race, stunning poll numbers, and the threat he poses to both parties. What he says he has to offer the American people tonight on Cuomo. My mental health was much better, but I struggled with uncontrollable movements called TD, tardive dyskinesia. TD can be caused by some mental health meds. And it's unlikely to improve without treatment. I felt like my movements were in the spotlight. Number one prescribed Ingresa is the only TD treatment for adults that's always one pill once daily. Ingresa 80 milligram is proven to reduce TD movements in seven out of 10 people. People taking Ingresa can stay on most mental health meds. Ingresa can cause depression, suicidal thoughts, or actions in patients with Huntington's disease. Pay close attention to and call your doctor if you become depressed, have sudden changes in mood, behaviors, feelings, or have thoughts of suicide. Don't take Ingresa if you're allergic to its ingredients. Ingresa may cause serious side effects, including angioedema, potential heart rhythm problems, and abnormal movements. Report fevers, stiff muscles, or problems thinking as these may be life-threatening. Sleepiness is the most common side effect. It's nice. People focus more on me. Ask your doctor about number one prescribed once daily in Gressa. What if my type 2 diabetes takes over? What if all I do isn't enough? Or what if I can do diabetes differently? Now you can with Once Weekly Manjaro. Manjaro helps your body regulate blood sugar. And Manjaro can help decrease how much food you eat. Three out of four people reached an A1C of less than 7%. Plus, people taking Manjaro lost up to 25 pounds. Manjaro is not for people with type 1 diabetes or children. Don't take Manjaro if you're allergic to it. You or your family have medullary thyroid cancer or multiple endocrine neoplasia syndrome type 2. Stop Manjaro and call your doctor right away if you have an allergic reaction, a lump or swelling in your neck, severe stomach pain, vision changes, or diabetic retinopathy. Serious side effects may include pancreatitis and gallbladder problems. Taking Manjaro with sulfonylurea or insulin raises low blood sugar risk. Tell your doctor if you're nursing, pregnant, or plan to be. Side effects include nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, which can cause dehydration and may worsen kidney problems. I can do diabetes differently with Mount Jaro. Ask your doctor about once weekly Mount Jaro. I have type 2 diabetes, but I manage it well. It's a little pill with a big story to tell. I take one daily Jardians at each day start. As time went on, it was easy to see. I'm lowering my A1C. Jardians works 24 7 in your body to flush out some sugar. And for adults with type 2 diabetes and known heart disease, Jardians can lower the risk of cardiovascular death, too. Jardians may cause serious side effects, including ketoacidosis that may be fatal, dehydration that can lead to a sudden worsening of kidney function, and general yeast or urinary tract infections. A rare life-threatening bacterial infection in the skin of the perineum could occur. Stop taking Jardians and call your doctor right away if you have symptoms of this infection, ketoacidosis, or an allergic reaction, and don't take it if you're on dialysis. Taking Jardians with the sulfonylurea or insulin may cause low blood sugar. Jardians. Stop everything you're doing. Look at your screen. If you have Medicare, you need to call this number right now during the Medicare annual enrollment period. It's time to find out if there is a plan available with additional benefits and savings compared to your current plan. The Medicare Benefit Helpline is accepting calls right now to see what plans with additional benefits are available to you. Plans may offer more benefits and savings than you are receiving with your current plan. Everyone on Medicare should call to make sure you're getting a plan with the benefits you want. Call the Medicare Benefit Helpline for your free, no obligation Medicare benefits review. You don't get a Medicare Advantage plan with extra benefits automatically. You need to take action. Right now is the time to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan with additional benefits and savings. Call 800-715-2895. That's 800-715-2895. Call now. Welcome back to News Nation Now. This is a live look at San Francisco where President Biden is meeting with Chinese leader Xi Jinping for the first time in more than a year. They're set to discuss a wide range of topics, including military conflicts, drug trafficking, and AI. But it's not just the high-stakes meeting that has everyone talking about. It's the location. Both world leaders are at a private estate nearly 30 miles south of San Francisco. 
News Nation's Kelly Beeson is live in our newsroom with details we've learned about about this pristine property. Uh, Kelly, clearly the location mattered to both leaders. It certainly did, Nick, and we are learning now that these two world leaders, they're meeting right now, privately away from the APEC meeting that's happening in San Francisco. Their goal is to hopefully de-escalate tensions between the U.S. and China. So initially, Nick, the Biden administration was keeping the exact location of this private meeting secret, only saying it was in the Bay Area. But News Nation has learned more about the site, just 26 miles south of San Francisco, and you've likely seen it before. Delicate diplomacy will play out on these grounds. Nestled in the vibrant landscape of California's Bay Area, the 654-acre Filoli estate was built back in 1917 by an oil baron. It's now owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation, open for private events like weddings and for movie productions. It served as the Carrington Mansion for the 1980s hit show Dynasty, the gardens used in Jennifer Lopez's film The Wedding Planner in 2001. The main house will likely host Biden and Xi as they sit down to hash out their differences. It's a small part of the overall estate, but at 54,000 square feet with 56 rooms, 17 fireplaces, 15 bathrooms, and 10 main bedrooms, it's worth an estimated $8.6 million. If the world leaders want to air out their grievances, they'll have 16 acres of formal gardens to stroll. The property also has a fruit orchard, redwood groves, and natural springs. The setting removes Biden and Xi from distractions and security concerns, as the property has been closed for what the website says is decorating for the holidays. In reality, it's been undergoing security sweeps by both countries in anticipation of today's meeting. Now, this meeting, Nick, it's expected to last four hours. Major announcements on fentanyl and communications between the administrations, especially the two militaries, are anticipated. Nick. We will all be watching Kelly Beeson Live for us this afternoon. Kelly, thank you. Only two weeks after their sobering testimony before a Senate committee, the director of the FBI, the secretary of Homeland Security, and the head of National Counterterrorism Center giving new details about the increasing dangers now facing the U.S. News Nation's Joe Khalil is live on Capitol Hill. And Joe, what new information did you learn from just today's meeting? Well, there's a lot there, Nick. In fact, they are actually still meeting now, approaching six hours for this hearing. And there was a lot about the border, a lot about communist China and those threats. But I think what really stood out was just the extent to which terrorist organizations like Hamas currently are threatening the United States, are trying to recruit people and to use what happened in Israel on October 7th to inspire others to commit acts of terrorism in the United States and on uh, the homeland. That is the real and very uh, verifiable threat, according to these leaders here, the director of Homeland Security, or Secretary Mayorkas, uh, and the director of counterterrorism, Christine Abizade, and the FBI director, Christopher Wray, all of them harping on that, saying there may be people even now in the United States with sympathies to groups like Hamas, and that it may not take whole groups or organizations. It could simply be one or two individuals even that could do some real harm to Americans. Here's how Director Abizade uh, really uh, elaborated on this threat. Our current heightened threat posture is driven primarily by our concern that individuals may increasingly mobilize for attacks, particularly against Jewish, Arab, and Muslim communities. This is consistent with our years-long assessment that those inspired to terrorism, rather than those directly linked to hierarchical organizations, are the most likely to carry out a successful attack on U.S. soil. Now, one concern that Director Ray from the FBI and Secretary Mayorkas brought up is they have a number of tools they use to try to combat terrorism and prevent attacks before they happen. And a lot of that authority comes from Congress. And right now, that authority in many aspects is set to expire. Things like their surveillance drones they use over the border, things like the FISA warrants, which, in other words, would be the way they go to a judge and get permission to do surveillance on uh, foreign people and also uh, people in the United States, potentially, uh, if there are terroristic 
threats. And there's some debate right now in Congress about whether the FBI has abused that authority. And both of these leaders talked about how that is an essential tool, especially right now, given the threat level that they need and they want Congress to re-up. We heard the same concern from the top Democrat uh, on this committee, Benny Thompson, when we caught up with him. We have to make sure that we put the resources there to uh, continue to protect us. Uh, a lot of my colleagues tend to talk tough, but when it's time to approve the resources to protect us, they vote against it. Yeah. And so that's my real concern. And, Nick, I'll just leave you with this. Today we also heard that there were some 200 people on the terror watch list that were apprehended at the southern border over the last year or so. That doesn't count gotaways, by the way, which, again, we simply don't have information uh, on those cases. Joe Khalil live for us today in the nation's capital. Joe, thank you so much. Well, we're learning more about hundreds of people left stranded on, airplane and, on an airplane and unable to attend a big rally in Washington in support of Israel. Now, organizers say some 300,000 people filled the National Mall, but three planes full of Jewish Americans from Detroit were not among them. Frustrated passengers trapped on the tarmac for hours, telling News Nation their chartered bus drivers were a no-show. Correspondent Evan Lambert is live at Dulles Airport. Evan, any response from that bus company involved? Nick, the stranded group, the Jewish Federation of Detroit, has not identified the bus company. What we do know is that a group of about 300 from that group were stuck here on the tarmac for a total of about 11 hours. It meant that they did not make the rally that they had flown all the way from Michigan for. I want to show you some video from one of the planes. It shows the group trying to remain and keep their spirits high. They're chanting, singing songs, but also disappointed and angry that they were missing the March for Israel. The group's senior director of community relations, David Kurzman, was on the trip. He tells News Nation the drivers of the buses they hired to take them from their charter flight to D.C. called out sick when they learned who the passengers were and where they were going. Kurzman called it a, quote, deliberate, malicious act, saying the bus drivers, quote, refused their assignments. They tried to get other buses to pick them up from the private terminal, but they were not successful in time for the whole group to get there. Some were able to get alternate transportation, leaving about 300 people behind. News Nation Live's Marnie Hughes spoke earlier with one of the passengers. Two and a half hours later of sitting on the plane, it became known that there was a, um, a staged or a coordinated effort by the drivers who were supposed to be taking us from the airport to the rally to refuse to do so. Uh, they did not want a plane full of Jewish people from Detroit to be able to go to this peaceful rally in support of Israel. And we reached out to the airline that the group chartered. Sometimes the airlines help arrange transportation from that private, uh, the tarmac rather, to the private terminal. We have not heard back from that airline. Nick. Evan Lambert live for us this afternoon at Dulles Airport. Evan, thank you. Former President Donald Trump is requesting a mistrial in his $250 million New York business fraud case. In a court filing today, attorneys for Mr. Trump his two adult sons and top Trump Organization executives argued the trial is biased. New York Attorney General Letitia James issued a statement saying Trump is trying to distract from his fraud and dismiss the facts and the truth. Well, up next, a News Nation exclusive. We hear from the attorney representing the one woman who may know the Gilgo Beach murder suspect better than anyone else. Plus, the case at the center of a twisted love trial could all be coming down to an end. What could happen next that could change everything? It's easy to get lost in investment research. Introducing J.P. Morgan Personal Advisors. Hey, David. Connect with an advisor to create your personalized plan. Let's find the right investments for your goals. Okay, great. J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. RSV can be a dangerous virus. 
for those 60 and older. It's not just a cold. And if you're 60 or older, you may be at increased risk of hospitalization from this highly contagious virus. Not all dangers come with warning labels. Talk to your pharmacist or doctor about getting vaccinated against RSV today. RSV vaccines, including Pfizer's, are now available. NetCredit is here to say yes you believed in me. to a personal loan or line of credit, even when other lenders won't. Apply online in minutes and get funds deposited the next business day or sooner. Go to netcredit.com. Netcredit. Credit to the people. At Humana, we believe your health care should evolve with you. And part of that evolution means choosing the right Medicare plan for you. Humana can help. Hi, my name is Sam Davis, and I'm going to tell you about Medicare Advantage prescription drug plans that can provide more coverage than original Medicare, including prescription drug coverage, all wrapped up into one convenient plan. These are affordable, all-in-one plans that cover Medicare Parts A, B, and D. They help pay for hospital stays and emergency care, doctor visits, and they also include prescription drug coverage. With Original Medicare, you're covered for hospital stays and doctor office visits, but you have to meet a deductible for each, and then you're still responsible for 20% of the cost. Next, let's look at Medicare supplement plans. If a service is covered under Original Medicare, then a Medicare supplement plan pays for some or all of your Medicare deductibles and the 20% coinsurance, but they may have higher monthly premiums and no prescription drug coverage. Humana Medicare Advantage prescription drug plans are different. Instead of having to add a separate Part D drug plan, these all-in-one plans include the same things as original Medicare, plus prescription drug coverage for both generic and brand name drugs. You also get dental coverage that includes two free cleanings a year, plus a yearly exam. Vision coverage includes vision exams, and a yearly allowance toward eyewear such as lenses or contacts. And hearing benefits include routine hearing exams and coverage toward hearing aids. You're covered for preventive services like annual mammograms and prostate exams. There's a zero dollar copay for routine vaccines and telehealth visits. And you get worldwide coverage for emergencies when you travel. You get all this in one convenient plan. Plus, there's a cap on your out-of-pocket costs. Call the number on your screen for this free, fact-filled decision guide. There's no obligation, just good information. If you want the facts about Medicare, call right now for the free decision guide from Humana. With a Humana Medicare Advantage prescription drug plan, your prescription drug coverage is already built in. You're covered when you go to the doctor, a specialist, or the hospital. You get coverage for emergencies, even when you travel. You're covered for preventive services like annual mammograms and prostate exams. There's a $0 copay for routine vaccines and telehealth visits. And these plans include dental, vision, and hearing coverage. So call or go online today to see if there's a Humana plan in your area and to get our free decision guide. Licensed Humana sales agents are standing by, so call now. And make a note, the Medicare annual enrollment period ends on December 7th. Humana, a more human way to healthcare. Red Lobster's new lobster and shrimp celebration. We got tails, shrimp, waiters, potatoes, sauces, little bosses, cheddar fish, stuff, and no bluff. And three lobster and shrimp entrees for a limited time. Taste it. Welcome back. For the first time since his arrest, the estranged wife of Gilgo Beach murder suspect Rex Hureman was in court for her husband's appearance. This is the first time the accused killer has had a family member in court for one of his appearances. Hureman is accused of murdering three women on Long Island, but he's also suspected in the murder of a fourth. News Nation's Laura Engel has been following this case and joins us live from Riverhead, New York. Laura, I understand that his wife, Asa Ellerup, appeared at the courtroom today rather subdued, not there necessarily to make a splash. 
you know, it was a very interesting day. We'll say that it really created a bit of a media circus. That's to put it mildly. Uh, and it is the first time you're right that we saw Asa Ellerup come here to court. It is the first public appearance that she has made um, in terms of seeing her husband here to watch the legal proceedings in person. And while sitting in court, we saw them, the two of them trading glances briefly just after some of the discovery issues were discussed between the attorneys in front of the judge. Asa Ellerup arrived this morning, as you mentioned, with her attorney, and she also had a film crew in tow. And while not confirmed, it is widely reported that she is working with the documentary film crew about this very case, all of it causing a lot of reporters to circle her as she went in and out of this courthouse. She did not offer any comment today. Now, once inside the courtroom, she listened on as her husband stood in front of the judge while attorneys discussed some really important documents relating to the crime lab reports as part of the discovery. And listen to this, 13 thousand photos that were taken during the execution of the search warrant at their family home in Massapequa Park. A human's attorney, Mike Brown, spoke to reporters after the conference and said that they are hoping to get, uh, you know, a lot more documents in this case and telling the judge they need everything related to their client because they are interested in moving forward to get to a trial date. After his wife gave him a brief smile in court, she was ushered out. And Rex Hewerman, of course, is accused of killing three of the Gilgo Four victims in the Long Island serial killer case. The district attorney telling reporters a grand jury is still investigating him in the murder of the fourth victim. And uh, this was the second time Asa Ellerup was seeing her husband in a week. She visited him in jail last Wednesday for the first time since his arrest this summer, while his defense attorney, Mike Brown, and her attorney, Robert Macedonio, wouldn't reveal what they talked about. They did offer us this. My understanding is, is that she doesn't believe that he was capable or committed these acts. Uh, so it, he, he certainly appreciates that support. I think like anybody with their spouse, you don't want to believe they're capable of this. Um, he's accused of some heinous crimes, and she wants to see and hear the evidence in the courtroom, not the media or the podcast. And I asked Robert Macedonio if that means that she is going to be coming, his client, Asa Ellerup, uh, to the next few court appearances. And he has said that she is very interested in seeing what the evidence will be presented in court. The next court date is February 6th. Nick. Laura, thank you so much. In Nevada, eight teens are now facing murder charges in the brutal beating death of 17-year-old Jonathan Lewis Jr. Lewis, who died in the hospital from his injuries a week after the attack, had reportedly stepped in to help a younger child. That's when the group set their sights on him, carrying out a gruesome assault that was all caught on camera. News Nation senior national correspondent Brian Enton is live for us. Brian, it took two weeks for these charges to be filed. What do we know about the suspects so far? Uh, well, we know that they're young teenagers. This is, this is an awful story, hard to wrap your minds around. We spoke to the victim's dad earlier this week, and now this big news, the arrest of eight students, and they are charged with murder. Teenagers charged with murder. Look at this. This is the disturbing video uh, where you see Jonathan, Jonathan Lewis beaten to death near Rancho High School. That's in Las Vegas. Uh, the brutal beating, police say, was sparked by a fight over headphones. The teens involved... Now charged with murder range in age uh, 13 to 17 years old. The victim, again, in the hospital for a week uh, before he passed away. His family says he was actually trying to help a smaller kid at the school, a kid who was the victim of bullying when all of this began. Investigators called what happened a void of humanity and say the trauma to Lewis's head was just not survivable. His family says he was on life support before passing away. During our investigation, we quickly learned that the fight was actually over a pair of stolen wireless headphones and possibly over a stolen marijuana vape pen uh, from incidents that occurred earlier in the week. And that as a result of those stolen items, which were taken from the victim or the victim's friends, they had agreed to fight with several of the subjects in the back alley uh, where the fight occurred. Okay, so again, uh, police arrested the eight teenagers. They are charged with murder, but they actually say that there are two other teenagers that they are looking for right now. So it may have been 10 teens involved overall. Investigators say they have started the process to charge those teens uh, as adults. Brian, Nick. you've covered so many of these things before. Before I let you go, 
Do you believe that the video helped to exacerbate this problem, or is this being a useful tool for investigators? Well, it's obviously useful to investigators. And something interesting, Nick, is they believe there's more video out there. So when they had that news conference, that was one of the reasons they wanted to do it, to say, hey, other people who may have video, uh, please share it with us. So it certainly helps investigators. I mean, you can see who's, who's responsible. It's right there on video. What's so awful about these videos, though, Nick, is that they then get shared on TikTok, on Facebook, on Instagram. Uh, and it, it's just humiliating for the victims and their families. It's like they have to relive it over and over again. Uh, and, and all the kids start sharing it around the school. That part of it is really disheartening. And Brian, it seems to live forever. Brian Enton live for us this afternoon. Brian, thank you so much. Well, Philadelphia police are asking for help identifying a group of suspects who robbed a man at gunpoint in front of a small child. Take a look at this video. This is security footage from inside the victim's home. It shows suspects assaulting a person in the kitchen as the child walked up to them. In some video, you can hear this child screaming at the top of its lungs. Now, according to police, the suspects pulled up in a vehicle, led the victim back into the house at gunpoint, and then made off with a safe, jewelry, and firearms. Wow, really tough to watch. A new twist in the federal case against Hunter Biden, who has requested to subpoena former President Trump and former DOJ officials. This is an attempt by Mr. Biden to prove that the criminal prosecution he is facing is politically motivated. Now, in the face of three federal gun charges, the president's son is demanding Trump, former AG Bill Barr, and others turn over documents concerning the investigation. The charges were filed against Mr. Biden after a plea deal fell through earlier this year. Well, up next, the tables turn in the twisted love triangle that ended in a gruesome murder. What's next for Caitlin Armstrong as her team gets ready to make their closing arguments? Coming up next, News Nation Now on News Nation, news for all America. December 6th, in a live primetime event, the News Nation Republican primary debate on the only network for all America, News Nation. I have moderate to severe Crohn's disease. Now, there's Sky Rizzy. Things are looking up, I've got symptom relief. Control of my Crohn's means everything to me. Significant symptom relief at four weeks with Skyrizi, including less abdominal pain and fewer bowel movements. Skyrizi is the first IL-23 inhibitor that can deliver remission and visibly improve damage of the intestinal lining. And the majority of people experienced long-lasting remission at one year. Serious allergic reactions and an increased risk of infections or a lower ability to fight them may occur. Tell your doctor if you have an infection or symptoms, had a vaccine or plan to. Liver problems may occur in Crohn's disease. Now's the time to ask your gastroenterologist how you can take control of your Crohn's with SkyRizzy. Control is everything to me. Oh, Learn how AbbVie could help you save. It's easy to get lost in investment research. Introducing J.P. Morgan Personal Advisors. Hey, David. Connect with an advisor to create your personalized plan. Let's find the right investments for your goals. Okay, great. J.P. Morgan Wealth Management. Meet Gold Bond Daily Healing, a powerhouse lotion that moisturizes, heals, and smooths dry skin with seven moisturizers and three vitamins. And new Gold Bond Healing Sensitive, clinically shown to heal and moisturize dry, sensitive skin. Gold Bond. After last month's massive solar flare added a 25th hour to the day, many businesses are wondering what should we do with it? Bacon and eggs 25 7. You're darn right. We could use it for personal growth. How about a longer lunch? What if we used it to work more? Uh, 25 hour protection. Nailed it. In financial news, solar stocks are up 20% with the additional hour of daylight. So with the extra hour, I'm thinking company wide power now. I don't sleep. Let's take a vote. Who wants to sleep? This is going to wreak havoc on overtime approvals. Maybe we should sleep on it. Anything can change the world of work. From HR to payroll, ADP designs forward-thinking solutions to take on the next anything. I'm ruined. For over 25 years, LoveSack has been rewriting the rules of comfort. It's okay to change your style. 
get messy. Get immersed. With Love Sack, you make the rules. Stop everything you're doing. Look at your screen. If you have Medicare, you need to call this number right now during the Medicare annual enrollment period. It's time to find out if there is a plan available with additional benefits and savings compared to your current plan. The Medicare Benefit Helpline is accepting calls right now to see what plans with additional benefits are available to you. Plans may offer more benefits and savings than you are receiving with your current plan. Everyone on Medicare should call to make sure you're getting a plan with the benefits you want. Call the Medicare Benefit Helpline for your free, no obligation Medicare benefits review. You don't get a Medicare Advantage plan with extra benefits automatically. You need to take action. Right now is the time to enroll in a Medicare Advantage plan with additional benefits and savings. Call 800-715-2895. That's 800-715-2895. Call now. Right now, rescue crews are scrambling to pull out about 40 workers now trapped for four days inside a collapsed Himalayan highway tunnel. Workers have been trapped since Sunday with crews trying to drill through the rubble and insert steel pipes to free them. Officials say the workers are considered safe and have food, water and oxygen being supplied through a pipe. But some of them are starting to get sick. Right now, loose rocks and falling debris has hampered the efforts to try and remove them. We have seen exclusive reporting from News Nation's Ali Bradley today, highlighting the migrant crisis at the southern border. And that crisis is causing massive problems across the United States, including major cities like Chicago. Kelly Beeson is live in our newsroom with the latest. Kelly. Yeah, these numbers pretty incredible, Nick. This just into the newsroom, one of the lowest documented job approval ratings recorded by a mayor in modern Chicago history. Let's break it down. So today marks six months since Mayor Brandon Johnson's inauguration. And take a look at these numbers, Nick. According to the Lincoln poll, 28% of Chicago voters polled approve of Johnson's work as mayor, while half disapprove. His management of crime and public safety, that's apparently doing a lot to sink his favorability, as well as his handling of the migrant crisis. Less than a quarter of registered Chicago voters approve of his handling on that issue specifically, while nearly two-thirds disapprove. So over 20,000 migrants have arrived in Chicago since last August. The city has been slowly moving people out of temporary spaces like police stations and into shelters. And at last check nearly 1,500 migrants are still living at police stations around Chicago awaiting shelter placement. And that number is actually down nearly half from the beginning of just this month, Nick. And Kelly, I remember attending that inauguration and covering it here for News Nation. I cannot believe six months has passed, and I'm sure that Mr. Johnson is thinking the same. Kelly Beeson, live for us this afternoon in the newsroom. Kelly, thank you. The prosecution has rested its case in the trial of Caitlin Armstrong, the woman accused of murdering pro cyclist Anna Mo Wilson. In an alleged jealous rage over her involvement with Armstrong's on again, off again boyfriend, Colin Strickland. Now, Armstrong's defense team is now making its case in what has come to be known as the Love Triangle Murder Trial. News Nation correspondent Alex Capriello has been our eyes and ears in the courtroom for the past three weeks. Alex, the state rested its case today. Does it seem like this could be wrapping up soon, or are we only at still halfway the halfway point? Well, the defense is calling its witnesses right now. That's half the battle. We don't know exactly how many witnesses they plan to call. When we take a look at their list, it only shows about six or seven names. So it could be a quick affair. Obviously, when the defense finishes their witness list, then it goes to closing arguments. But there's some jockeying that has to happen after that. For example, no court, no cameras are allowed in the courtroom right now. So the court has to take a break to allow our pool reporter and pool camera team to actually go inside there. Whether that actually happens today, or potentially maybe even tomorrow morning. We have yet to see or know, but obviously we're going to be monitoring it. Alex, I know that you and your producer, Darius, have been juggling names and locations and trying to put all of this information in order. Can you tell us about the witnesses uh, that the defense has called so far and what they're actually saying? Yeah, obviously the defense trying to sow as much doubt as possible in the minds of the jury. So we've heard from a number of expert witnesses today, the first one being a fingerprint analyst. Uh, the defense questioned why Caitlin Armstrong's fingerprints were the only ones 
that these fingerprint experts were actually testing and why not Colin Strickland? Why not Caitlin Cash? Also, a DNA expert, that person uh, testified that it actually might have been Mo Wilson who inadvertently transferred Caitlin Armstrong's DNA to Mo Wilson's bike handlebars. That's called touch DNA and transfer DNA. She wouldn't even know she was doing it. Expert who is now debunking leading theories. To ballistic Alex attack. Capriello, live for us in L.A. We're losing his audio, and I had so many more questions. Alex will continue to follow that story and have the latest. Listen, Iceland, right now, they're rattled by a staggering 800 earthquakes today amid a warning of a possible volcanic eruption. Most of the small quakes occurred about three miles below ground. Damage is minor. This comes after Iceland was struck by 700 small quakes yesterday. A scary and deadly situation for a group of passengers as their ferry boat capsized in the Bahamas. Take a look at this video. Officials say a 75-year-old woman from Colorado died. Two others were taken to the hospital after that ferry boat sank near Blue Lagoon Island. Multiple agencies assisted in getting people to shore. No word on what caused the ferry boat to sink. Listen, I'm Nick Smith, and from Nicole Burley from Chicago. Thank you so much for watching us this afternoon. My colleague, Connell McShane, picks up our news coverage from New York. Connell, good hey, afternoon. Hey there, Nick. Good to see you. And we're live from our newsroom here in New York City. Another big day, and it's a very big meeting. It's happening right now. President Biden and China's Xi Jinping getting together and doing so at this very hour. Their first face-to-face -face in more than a year comes as relations between the two superpowers are hovering near an all-time low. President Biden's been clear going in that his goal is to reestablish communication with his Chinese counterpart, not only for military.